Hello and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. We're David Waxman and Minnie Ingersoll, partners and investors at 10110. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining us. You have been a venture investor here in LA for over a decade. You're one of the founders of Crosscut. You guys um, started, I think, in 2008. I just was looking this up, currently investing out of Fund 4, I believe. Correct. And um, when I moved to LA, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do, but I was just moving home and I someone set us up for a coffee and you were super kind to me. And I really appreciate that. And I said, I might be thinking about venture, but I don't really know what that entails. And you said, look, I'll tell you more about it and you can come and meet the rest of my partners. And I um, am very, very grateful. So this podcast is not about me. It's about you. So we found it's always better if we start slightly linearly and just have you tell us a little about your background and how you got here. Sure. Happy to do so. And thanks for having me. Yeah, I was born and raised in L.A., um, uh, ended up in the Bay Area for undergrad and graduate school and worked in Silicon Valley during the first internet bubble, 1995 to 2001. And when I finished my MBA program, I very much had a, I need to get out of here kind of framework and wanted to start my life here with my wife, Elisa in LA. Had no job when I moved back down here, had an interest in venture and was introduced to Rick at a firm called Palomar Ventures in 2001. And so that's where my venture background started after a background in strategy consulting and, um, and uh, operating. So got here in 01 and have been venture investing in LA since, since that time. So coming on 19 years and then uh, randomly moved in next door to Brett Brewer, the house I bought in the Palisades. And he quickly became Uncle Brett to my kids while he was still scaling Intermix Media. And I joke, but it's true. He was yelling about my dogs, you know, pooping near his hot tub. And <laughs> I was yelling at him to keep the noise down because he was keeping my baby up at night. And we became fast friends. And so the three of us came together in um, 2007 with a belief that L.A. was going to be an important and viable tech ecosystem. And wanted to put a fund solely focused on catalyzing this market together. Um, and so that happened in, in 07, 08. Yeah, that was a really non-obvious thing in 07, 08. Um, I don't know how many funds were down here, but probably you could count them on your hands. Yeah, the, the funds that were here are no longer here. It was uh, Clearstone, Palomar, Mission, Enterprise Partners, and... Um, and uh, was Anthem? No, were they different? Anthem was kind of around, um, but really... There's all, GRP. GRP, now, now yes, upfront. now up front. Um, but at that time, I don't think Mark had shown up yet. Dana hadn't arrived from the Bay Area to take on uh, to start Graycroft. So it was a pretty nascent market. And especially when the recession of 08 hit, um, everybody kind of disappeared. The angels disappeared. There was really no capital in the system, in, in this remember. geo system. Yeah. And I was trying to remember when we actually sat down the first time. And I feel like it was when I was still at Spot Runner. Or I definitely maybe. remember sitting down at Spot Runner. That I would yeah. guess that's probably the first time that we connected. Yeah, and I don't remember what year that was. <laughs> it was it was before 2010. Yeah. And so everyone talks about LA early investing as like consumer media. Is that where you guys started? And is that still how how broad are you now? We're broad. Um, we just finished our offsite last week. Spent a lot of time looking at. Uh, a whole bunch of things, partnership dynamics, communication styles, decision-making frameworks. But we also categorize the areas that we invest in and the areas that we have interest in. And you're right, I Minnie, mean, it's like when we started this thing, the first fund was all ad tech and e-commerce. And we really talked about it back then is the fund was started to be this convergence of tech and media. But at its core, it was really LA was first generation traffic arbitrage, right? It was, it was lead generation businesses. It was monetizing web traffic value here of the cost of a click off of Google versus what you could sell it over here for. And there were some phenomenal businesses built around that first generation mentality. It's the lower my bills and price grabber and shopzilla. Those are three that, that you name of intermix monetized all types of web traffic and sold products. So that was really first gen stuff. Huh. Cool. Can I jump in and just ask you about, like, you just said you just had an offsite or um, sure. decision-making frameworks. Uh, what did you guys discuss? What was interesting? Well, it depends how deep you want to go on this. This is a whole podcast in and of itself. Um, we've spent a lot of time looking at, uh, at a more holistic level, what the machine of venture does and what our kind of core processes are as a firm. 
and how we can put a, a better product out into the marketplace. And, and you know, David asked before we started about our survey, we did put a survey out in the community to catch feedback on what are we doing well? How can we better serve the community? So all of this stuff is centered around our core values and kind of what we believe in and how we want to act and operate on a daily basis. And then we're legitimately trying to get feedback on where we're falling short. Um, we're all flawed humans. We all have issues or mistakes we make and and we need to be cognizant of that. So most of the offsite was centered around trying to understand personality styles and how the nine of us interact on a daily basis. And you know, just give you examples, we did an Enneagram assessment and um You're like a flying peacock or something, right? They're, you're tigers uh, and I'm a I'm a challenger, uh, which won't surprise anybody. I'm extremely blunt and direct. And I feel very strong about my opinions. No shock there. Brett is a peacemaker and tries to very positive, optimistic, but doesn't want uh, disharmony to exist. Rick is an achiever, which is, and I also have signs of the achiever syndrome, which is put your head down and grind and overwork and burn yourself out, but you are singularly focused on a task or a mission at hand. And uh, Clinton is an investigator, so very internally thoughtful, lots of thought generation on ideas and theses, but not as good at sharing that across um, externally. Oh, and man. so it's, you know, it's really the questioning thing that says, well, when you got that, what do you do with that? <laughs> right? Throw that on the table. And how does that lead to a partnership? And how do you make decisions? Because at the end of the day, that's our business, right? The two of you have to sit down and make a decision about to invest or not invest. We have to do it with, you know, seven investment professionals. So, so if I were a founder listening to this, and I hope a lot of founders will listen to this, what should I make of that description of the different partners and how, like, if I were to want to approach you guys, should I pick a partner? Should I come? What's the best way to, to start the path to being invested in by Crosscut? I think the, at the highest level, um, you know, I think the biggest flaw of venture firms is a lack of transparency in how their decisions get made. And I think the commitment we're making as a partnership is feel free to ask and we will tell you and we will show you that our process, like everyone's, is flawed. It's flawed. There's just no getting around it. There's no one that has a perfect process for decision making. But at the end of the day, that's why LPs give us capital. And it's our job to make the best decisions we can with the data we have in front of us. Now, what they tend not to understand is that there are interpersonal dynamics and there are personality traits. And I'm happy to use myself as the guinea pig. I tend to come in a little bit dogmatic in my point of view and uh, and sometimes feel threatened by a lack of support. And where does that come from? Shit, way deep in my childhood that I'm just now beginning to understand, right? And so we do this work with these coaches because we're trying to understand what drives our behavior. We're not trying to say, hey, Brian, you're flawed for having that behavior. We're trying to understand why are you triggered in that way or why do you act this way. And so that's the work that the four of us are doing is to try to understand what do we bring to, to the table? What stories do we bring? What baggage do we bring? And how do we make better decisions? And so our commitment to the community is to just be better at explaining where this falls within our portfolio construction theories, what antitheses we have right now that are keeping us not interested in a category, and what needs to happen for all of us to get to consensus to say yes. And if you can do that, I think you you help the entrepreneurial community understand how to navigate these waters because raising capital is really hard. Is it a consensus process? Do you have to all Pretty agree? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things. It, it's not exact to that degree, but what we work really hard on is um, – unbiased initial feedback, which is what you just saw us do. We just filled out a digital survey on the company that had presented to us and a lot of follow-up questions to be answered to drive the process if we continue to move forward. And then the way it really works is if people have concerns, those concerns are voiced, the team that is running on the deal has to alleviate those concerns to a place where no partner is saying, yeah, I, I'm still not a fan of this or I don't want to do it. So we work really hard. Everybody has a veto, right? So if there's like over my dead body, I do not like that space, you can veto. That rarely happens. We're really trying to build a more collaborative decision-making framework, which is if you can speak candidly and not worry about offending the person across the table, um, I can then say, 
hey, David, I have this very serious concern about this market or about this team or about this product. Can you do the work to alleviate that concern? And if not, then I'm not a fan of supporting the deal. I was going to ask something uh, much more. I I thought you were going with um, something about how you guys fit in with like a larger fund and how that plays out um, in the dynamics of Silicon Valley coming to LA or, you know, how round sizes are changing. But it sounds like you guys had a deeper conversation that I was expecting. Oh, it was a very <laughs> emotional three days wow. for the firm. Um, I, I think we'd already, so the framework of the offsite was uh, the I, the we, and the it. And this is something that we've done in partnership with Evolution Coaching. If you guys know Jeff and Matt, we're doing something more formal with them in partnership. And, and I'm happy to discuss that. But the, the, the way day one was, is who is the, what is the story of yourself and your history and your life that bring, that you bring to the partnership? And then how do the we interact around those personality dynamics? And what are the goods and the bad traits of being a challenger or being a peacemaker? And then the it is the last piece. And we've been very fortunate with Nick Kim, our head of platform. We've done a lot of it work. But what we didn't have is what is the history that that you bring to the table every single day that drives your behavior, which affects the we and how you make decisions. And so the guys at Evolution were really impactful in that. And a lot of that is really emotional stuff. You know, it's like, I, again, I'll just speak to myself. I, you know, I'm pretty open. I lost my father when I was 13 and it's had a material impact on the way I've pursued the things I've pursued in my life. What is the it again? I missed the, sorry, I got the, the I and the we. The it is the end result of what the entity stands for and acts against. And right? that's what Nick, I've actually wondered because what platforms means to VCs sometimes, and I'm sure it probably means different things to different people. And I know you guys are great at having events yeah. and I've always been like, that's great. Maybe that's part of platform, but, yeah. but defining who you are. What yeah. For? Yeah. It's, you know, it's funny. The, the four of us, Clinton's been with us for six plus years. The rest of us, Rick, Brent, myself for 11. I think we came into this partnership without defining it with aligned morals and values and mission orientation. We've been pretty clear in that all along, but we had this like canned website with some surfers in Venice on it and a little bit of copy that I wrote on a weekend. Um, and so the first thing Nick did is he came in and said, you know, as a head of platform, we need to figure out how to tell the crosscut story in a clearer way um, and get that message out to the market. And we need to look at our systems and processes of how we look at venture. And, and I'm happy to talk about that. You know, he's done talks on this. It's your sourcing engine, your diligence frameworks, your decision-making processes, what we call growth. So the seed to series A playbook, the way we engage with our entrepreneurs to help them hit the milestones that attract capital and ultimately how you exit the business. And so he has built systems and processes and methodologies in all five buckets that we hope will allow us to say to our LPs and to the market, we have the best sourcing engine in LA. We have the best diligence framework that allows us to get to the real meat of what matters here in a yes or no decision. And then we've worked really hard on our partnership dynamics to get rid of all the bullshit in a partner conversation to truly use that data to make the best decisions. And then we know how to cue you up with our playbook of this is how you hit the milestones in your business. We'll bring you the best coaches. We're going to do everything we can to empower you to be the best entrepreneur you can be. And then when you're ready, we'll walk you into this Rolodex of 75 investors broken out by category to know which 10 conversations are the best for you to raise your A. I totally need to go watch Nick talk about these things. So that's platform to us. It, that piece is what he owns. And then on top of it, it's voice. And we just hired a director of marketing, brand new, uh, started this week, Beth Carter. Um, and we've done a bunch of other things that fall under platform that are based saying, how do we bring scale to the essence of what we want Crosscut to be? The scale of what you want Crosscut to be. I've also had a question about how much is Crosscut uh, in LA versus broader? And yeah. I actually just don't know what percent of your portfolio is sure. LA, but you play a big role here. Yeah. So uh, our, our first two funds, it was probably 80% LA. Um, and that was really because we had no management fees. We had no trouble budgets. <laughs> Brett and I were full-time operators. Uh, as we've gone institutional with the third fund and the fourth fund, 
it's probably now two thirds, one third LA. Mm -hmm. And the way we try to position the other one third is it's geographically agnostic. Um, it generally comes through our network of venture relationships that we've developed over those 11 years. And it usually, hopefully, is an opportunity where there is some aspect of LA that is critical to the success of that non-LA business. Either our domain expertise or our relationships here in LA are viewed to be important to the success of the company. And so instead of filling out a syndicate in Silicon Valley with two or three Silicon Valley funds, ideally those funds are saying, you know what, we should talk to the Crosscut team and see if they have an interest in this round. So with all this, this I mean, you've always been changing. Obviously, we're a little firm and yeah. you weren't working full-time on it to now yeah. a bigger firm where you're definitely full-time and you're working on improving yourselves. What has changed and, and maybe more importantly, what, how should people think about CrossCut today? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I made the comment about how if you don't tell your own story, someone tells it for you. I, I think that's been our biggest issue. Um, we took this stance is too strong of a word, but we, we started this fund when we were resource constrained and said one entrepreneur at a time, one deal at a time, let them tell our story and never made any efforts to do any PR on behalf of the fund. Um, so I think the, the story is that some, some people in this town still view us as the e-com guys. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's because we did shoe dazzle and Ipsy and Wink and a bunch of subscription commerce deals back before subscription commerce existed. Um, I can tell you we haven't done an e com deal in two and a half years. And uh, the kind of stuff that I'm doing now, I would describe it as more deep tech and fintech and, you know, verticalized financial services for the U.S. Hispanic immigrant population. Um, uh, Ken show that company. Yeah. Ken show, uh, pre seed deal, um, kind of a web MD for holistic health and alternative modalities of therapy. We hired Marine out of, uh, tech stars, uh, Cedar Sinai to run our whole healthcare tech initiatives and all of our healthcare tech investing. So we're pretty diverse now. And we talk about LA as being these kind of five core areas of thought leadership, not from us, from the ecosystem itself, content 2.0, which we don't do a lot in, um, esports and gaming, which we do do a lot in transportation and logistics, which you would probably call deep tech, space tech, which was the company that was just in our conference room, and healthcare tech because of everything that Cedars is doing. Those are just five areas of thought leadership. There are probably 14 others that we would say we invest in marketplaces, you name it. So we're pretty diverse now, pretty broad in what we do. So you mentioned earlier the anti theses. Who's on your anti list right now? Ad tech and e-commerce. <laughs> and deep tech, uh, you said that you're interested in deep tech, and then you said, is that transportation? Or like, what What do you consider deep tech? And what are you interested in? <sighs> well, so, um, again, we didn't publicize this much, but I, I've done one space tech deal, a company called Uber Labs up in Santa Barbara. Uh, he's developed a uh, antenna technology that allows him to deliver extremely high-resolution Earth observation through SAR synthetic aperture radar. Um, we've now raised enough money for that company to get the first satellites up into space, probably midway through next year. Really exciting potential business. Uh, we led a round with co-investors Pelion out of Utah in a company called fastdata.io. He does GPU software acceleration. So the idea that the Apache Spark um, architectures are kind of hitting their critical mass, they're kind of Moore's, Moore's law uh, mass, and that if you can port that over to a GPU architecture, you can increase data ingestion by up to a thousand X over Apache Spark. And so where is that useful? Um, geospatial data processing, which there's a ton happening because more satellites are going up into space. And he sits right in that nexus of that stuff. So that's cloud infrastructure, that's data center, but it's also data analytics and it's real time. Mm -hmm. So 5G connected car, that's deep tech. Um, we looked at things like uh, smart city intelligent routing systems on streetlights. We do a lot of work there, a company here in LA that we spent a lot of time with. So nobody really knows that side of Crosscut because we haven't told that story. And, um, and we're fortunate to sit in this amazing community where there are experts in all these buckets that are one call away because you know, we've been down here for 20 years. And I joke, but my diligence on my um, satellite deal 
was, he's a 30 year engineer at Raytheon. He was also my babysitter growing up in the Palisades. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, as space is such an interesting next frontier, I guess. Um, and you guys are always leading the deals or d- tell me about just the deals that you do. Yeah. What's so, a normal valuation? What's a normal check? So we, we put it in three buckets. Um, Pre-seed, think of that as like a million, a million and a half kind of round, and we could do 500K to a million there. Oh, um, and we'll do out of a fund, maybe there's 35 investments in a fund, we'll do five of those. Okay. So Ken shows an example of that. It was a million dollar round. We did it with Female Founders Fund, right? Oh. Split the round. The core bucket is traditional seed. Mm-hmm. Um, think of that as a two to three and a half million dollar round, usually done at a six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 pre, depending on geolocation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if we're leading it, we're writing um, two to two and a half million dollar check, million and a half check, trying to get early concentrated ownership. Think of that as 20 deals in a, in a fund. Mm-hmm. And then the other five-ish are either tweener rounds, like not quite at the A, maybe call that, think of that as like a four on 11, 12, 13, 14 kind of round Mm -hmm. where it's easier to take two and a half from us, million and a half from the seed investors and let us accelerate to uh, what we call like the mega A versus the normal A. And that seems to be happening a lot more. Bullpen's done a really good job on those types of deals. We are at a fun size where we can play there and do that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, so that's five deals in a fund. And then the last five are like crazy ass opportunistic A's done at high valuations from really reputable founders that aren't raising a three on seven. They're going straight to a eight on 32. Um, And so, you know, you want to be part of those deals. It's hard to get enough ownership to actually have it be meaningful to the fund, but you also want to make sure you're in the most interesting deals that LA is producing. Yeah. But you're still collaborating. So you're still investing out of fund four. Still investing out of fund four have not gotten to a place where we want to roll it our own. Right. Like, like we Still really believe in collaboration. We love everyone in this ecosystem and really honestly, like, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are not happy with us, but we want to be like the Switzerland of LA. Like we want to, we want to work with all the pre-seed funds. We want to work with all the Silicon Valley A funds. We want to work with the upfronts and the Gray Crofts and all the other A-run funds and not be a threat to anyone in what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Right. That's the idea is just like open our doors, let everyone come. I think that's why we do so much community related stuff and open door events. And we do events where we invite all the venture investors in town because, and we actually host events just for the pre-seed and seed funds because we want to know what you guys are up to, Mm -hmm. right? It's to our benefit to know what's coming through 10110. So here was a theory that I ran past David. I said that being in the place that you grew up sometimes makes you feel more like warmth or care towards the community. But I wasn't sure if that was true, but it's true for me moving back to LA. For sure. So I, I take great pride in making a lifestyle move back to the place I grew up and, you know, it's really simple. It's like, why did I leave Silicon Valley? I wasn't surfing and playing volleyball on the weekends. <laughs> and that's when I thought about the way I wanted my life to unfold with my wife and bringing kids into the world. You know, San Francisco just didn't cut it for me. It was like, you're not going to be waiting around for the nightlife and you're not going to go clubbing like we did when we were in our 20s. You're, I want to sit on the beach and have a drink. I want to play volleyball. I want to surf on the weekends. I did all three of those things this weekend, right? And spent time with my kids. And I was in bed by nine o'clock almost every night. Yeah. So um, you guys have a bit of a reputation of being bro-y. Yeah. But when I asked Sophia here at Crosscut, I asked her, like, what should I ask Brian about? And she said, he has this wonderful family life. He, He prioritizes his wife and his kids. So, you know, where does that, I'm sure you've heard that, that there's that reputation. Yet I've heard you talk with, a lot of passion about how you care about the community. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is that just because you like to surf and play volleyball? I think we didn't do ourselves service by having a website, you know, with stock video of a bunch of surfers <laughs> for it's three what years. I love about your website. That, that was honestly done by a company we were doing diligence on that Funny. spun us up a new website in 48 hours mm-hmm. with custom videography. I, you know, the the broy reputation is fair, absolutely fair. I would never argue anyone about that. Um, 
you know, I certainly started the fund with two other white males in 2008. And I did it because I trusted them and I respected them. And in my mind, we were going to war to try to pull something off that was not likely to work. The broiness is part the fact that like, we love to take people down to surf at the Bel Air Bay Club and, and instead of playing golf. Right. Um, Minnie's taken me to surf. Just yeah, good. So you know, <laughs> good. There are photo, there are photographs. Proof? Uh, do I want to see them? No. <laughs> okay. That's what I thought. Um, I think, uh, I think we, I think our history supports that we have been very collaborative with the community over time, but that perception is extremely fair, right? It's just, it's, it's one that we probably haven't done as good a job of dispelling as we probably could have um, through our actions. But I think our, I think our history supports that we have been very collaborative with the community and try to work really aggressively to push various agendas um, yeah. across the board. feels like you're really hard on yourself. Yeah, I think um, I always have been. I think it's part of why I'm here where I am today. You know, I'm, I always want to improve. That started with my own personal work that really finally started about a year ago. Um, and has continued to push me and, and this firm in a direction that I think is really positive about how we engage with each other, how we engage with the community. As you know, we got we did surveys. David asked me what the feedback was. A lot of it was sort of this bro culture or boys club. Mm. Um, you know, we're working hard to fix that, but that's not something you do overnight. You just can't make a hire to check the box. It has to be someone. We take a, a very strong stance on the what partnership means in venture. And, you know, from our point of view, like not, not everybody knows, but the, the four GPs are equal partners, even though they all didn't start the fund. And so this idea that we would just make a hire to be able to check that box is not something that we take lightly. And as you know, from our attempts to recruit you, it, it was, it was a, this is a process. This takes time. We have to really get to know each other. Um, and we're excited. There, there are things that will be happening over time, but there's, you know, there's nothing to point to yet that we have taken care of that dynamic. Um, and, and I think I've heard you talk some about how you help your portfolio companies and, and I think you've sort of talked about helping them with their culture or helping them with their emotional health as, as a big focus area for you, not just having them grow at all costs or. Yeah. So I'll, I'll reveal a little bit on that one. Um, I've talked very openly with a lot of people about my own personal experience in working with uh, Matt and Jeff at Evolution Coaching. Uh, it was a year ago this week that I went to a, a silent meditative retreat in Maui and had some real personal breakthroughs. Um, I'm almost embarrassed by the fact that it was a year ago because I have written some stuff on that topic that I have yet to publish, um, and it's coming, um, as well as a partnership with Evolution that we will be announcing soon. And the idea of this entire thing was if I can have such a personal breakthrough to understand why I am the way I am and make hopefully great strides in changing some of my personality traits or my behavioral traits that stem from my trauma as a child and the patterns that I've exhibited since that time. And if all of the success of our portfolios is really founder heavy, really like at seed stage, you know, what would we say? 80% of the success is on the founders. Then why aren't we putting every resource we have behind helping them succeed? Mm -hmm. And so what I concluded from that, I was like, man, if I can have this kind of like truly heart opening experience and bring a little greater vulnerability to the entrepreneurial journey, um, shouldn't I do that? Wouldn't that be probably the best product that I could introduce at a, at a seed stage level? And so we're going to be doing um, sort of committing capital and bespoke coaching on behalf of every investment we make and hoping that that is a real uh, tractor to Crosscut as part of our brand and part of our offering. And it's part of our core platform initiative. And it's really coming in and doing founder assessments and how the two of you would work together and where your strengths and weaknesses are and 360 assessments and putting an entire bespoke program from seed to series A in place as the capital comes into the business and hoping that we can start to see truly quantitative differences in the way these entrepreneurs manage the emotional stress, the loneliness, this idea that we can um, build better community here by bringing vulnerable topics to the table and saying like, 
instead of saying, how's the business going? The question is, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. it's just really simple things that I think this industry lost sight of along the way. I really do. You know, like it's all metrics. It's all, are you getting your KPIs? And that's not what it's really about at the end of the day. Because a lot of the greatest successes I've had are not financial successes. They're in the relationships I've built through a failure with an entrepreneur that mean the most to me. Yeah. Although uh, people always talk about how the first few 20, 50, 20 people at a company, 10 people set the culture. Um, and I think the same is true of cities. And I do think that LA has a different, um, more relaxed, more how are you doing as a first question than San Francisco, say. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's one of the, the key areas that we can continue to differentiate ourselves. But as more and more success comes to this market, we have to keep sight of that. Right. If we lose sight of that, if we don't stay in that mindset, we'll slip yeah. into yeah. the the greed yeah. and the problems that we see across the industry today. Yeah, you can certainly see the market getting more hard edged. Yeah. Down here. Yeah. This has been so interesting. Um, what's next for you and Crosscut? Really, for us, it's just um, stick to what got us here. You know, we're not trying to raise larger funds. We want to stay as a seed fund. Anything between 100 and 150 million is where we think we play well with five check writers here in the firm. Um, so I think it's just keep your head down and execute is really the beauty of, of where we finally sit compared to where we were. I look forward to having um, everyone else on the show too. Then we can hear about everyone's theses. Did we tell you that we accidentally also asked Rick to be on the show at the same time and then had to cut one of you guys? <laughs> I'm glad there, there's an internal competition. Um, everyone on the survey wanted to have like higher rankings. Yeah. There's a competitive <laughs> aspect to us. I mean, that's yeah. part of the, the bro -y natures. We're still competitive guys. Um, luckily there was no quantitative outcome that anyone can defend definitively say they won the survey. Right. Um, there was a lot of good... Uh, well, you won the podcast. Oh, thank you. I, <laughs> at least I got the invite. This was lovely, Brian. Yeah. Thank you oh, so much. Thanks for having me. No, it was great. Thanks. Thank you so much to all of you who are listening to these shows. Just having listeners is actually very cool. We are trying hard to put out content worth listening to, but feel free to send us feedback or just rate and review and we'll send you appreciation. 